Alhamdulillahirrabbilalamin Wassalatu wassalamu ala nabiyyil karim Wa ala alihi wa ashabihi ajma'in Amma ba'd Fa inna aslaka al-hadithi kitabullah Wa khiru hadi hadi muhammadin sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Wa syarru umuri muhdathatika Wa kullu muhdathatin bid'ah Wa kullu bid'atin dolala Wa kullu dolalatin finnah One of the things that cause a lot of young people today to experience doubt about Islam is the political weakness of the Ummah today. Many who are unfamiliar with our history, they look around the world today, they see the Muslim world in a state of political weakness, they see Muslim countries as backwards, lacking technology, state of poverty, and they make a few wrong assumptions. First, they assume that this political problems in the Muslim world, they assume it's because of Islam. That's the first wrong assumption. Second, they assume that this is the way it's always been, that the Muslim world has always been like this. And this comes from a lack of knowledge of our history. Because the reality is that we live in a time that is an anomaly, that is very different from the standard of Muslim history. From the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until a hundred years ago, for the bulk of that time, the Muslims weren't just a civilization or an empire. They were a superpower. For the bulk of our history, Muslims were one of the most dominant civilizations <coughs> in the history of this world. And when we are unaware of that part of our history and what Muslims contributed to the world during that time, <coughs> then it's very easy to fall for these traps and to look at the world today and think that there's something wrong with Islam. So today, inshallah, I want to very briefly go through the political rise of Islam in the first century. And then from there, I want to extract for us some lessons in terms of what Islam brought and contributed to the world. Because again, you know, we said the young people, they have these doubts. On the other hand, we have the non-Muslims, some of them who... They, ask, they look at Islam as outdated, and they look at Islam as backwards. And they say, what have Muslims ever contributed to this world? Well, today, I will share just some of those contributions to the world. The rise of Islam was miraculous. The rise of Islam was unlike any other civilization in the history of this world. The Arabs, 1,400 years ago, were a tribal society. They did not have a government. They did not have an economic structure. They were not an empire. They were literally living as tribes. From all of these tribes, there were a few small towns. The most famous of them was Makkah and Yatrin, which we call Medina today. And even in these towns, there were a few thousand people living there, and they were divided into tribes. And the tribal leaders would get together and they would form their, their political opinions on those discussions between the chiefs. But they never had a king. They never had a government. They never had a, a political structure. <clears throat> on either side of the Arabs were the two superpowers of the time, the Persians and the Romans. And both the Persians and the Romans chose to ignore Arabia. Both of these superpowers chose to ignore Arabia because they saw it as a waste of time. They saw it as a, as a desert full of, you know, backwards people with, with no civilization. They didn't see any point in conquering it. This was the, 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 the status of Arabia. It is from this land that Allah chose the best of creation, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa to be the final messenger. And he chose the best of people to be his followers, the Sahaba. And it's from this land that the Muslim empire grew. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam starts preaching Islam in Makkah. And within the first 13 years, he has maybe less than 100 followers. A very small amount of people. They migrate to Medina and they grow into a small community of a few thousand. And now there are wars going on between Makkah and Medina. Within a few years, they conquer Makkah. Before you know it, all of Arabia is now Muslim. Within a period of 23 years, Arabia goes from being tribes all with their own rulers to being under one ruler and one religion. And now Islam is the dominant force there. But it doesn't stop there. 
Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam passed away, and we entered the period of the Khulafa Rashidin. In the time of Abu Bakr and Umar, the Muslims conquered the entire Persian Empire. The Persian Empire ceases to exist. Now again, I want you to think about this historically. The Persians were the superpower of their time. Just ten years before that, people were expecting the Persians to wipe out the Romans. That's how powerful they were. The Arabs were literally just tribes, with no structure, with no technology, with no civilization, with no united power. They were just random tribes. The Persians were shocked to see these Arabs march into their lands and declare war on them. But the Muslims defeated them, and that land became the lands of Islam, and they remain lands of Islam until today. They spread in the opposite direction as well. The Roman lands, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, all became Muslim lands and remain Muslim lands until today. The Muslims grew even further. So after the time of the Khulafa Rashidi came the time of the Umayyads. In the Umayyads time, and this is still the first hundred years of Islam, in the Umayyads time, the Muslims go all the way to the east and conquer parts of India. They come right to the borders of China. And then to the west, the Muslims conquer all of North Africa, all the way to Spain. Within a hundred years, from Spain to India is one united land under Muslim rule. Again, at the time of Rasulullah the Muslims are less than a hundred people. Within a hundred years, they are an empire spanning from Spain all the way to India. This rise is unprecedented. No empire in history has grown that fast and remained stable. They were those that grew fast, like Alexander the Great, right? But they crumbled just as quickly. The Muslim empire grew that fast and stayed like that for over a thousand years. That's the miracle. So what did Muslims contribute to this world? The Muslims came and they conquered these lands. And what was interesting was the people living in these lands preferred Muslim rule over their previous rulers. It was the Christians of Spain who reached out to the Muslims in North Africa and said, please come and take over our land because our Christian rulers are oppressing us. They saw the justice in the Muslim land and they wanted a piece of that. The Christians of Syria openly admitted that they preferred the rule of the Muslims over their fellow Christian Romans because the Muslims were more just. So what did Islam bring to this world? Islam brought a system of perfect justice, the most just law system in the history of this world. And that justice system had a ripple effect on the rest of the world. For example, today across the world, almost every civilization has the principle of you are innocent until proven guilty. That principle originates in Islam. Islam was the first civilization to come up with this principle. That this is one of the maxims of fiqh, that human beings are innocent until proven guilty. And this is now a global norm. So Islam brought a higher level of justice to the world. Islam brought a solution to racism. It brought a solution to racism. Racism remains a problem in the world today. This is true even in the Muslim world. But in those lands where they took Islam seriously and they practiced Islam completely, Racism was able to be removed 1,400 years ago to such an extent that we had Muslim rulers throughout history from all kinds of different races and backgrounds. And we have Muslim empires from all over the world. We've had Arab Muslim empires, Turkish Muslim empires, North African Muslim empires. Muslims came from all over and they were all given opportunities to rise. The Islam came with a solution to racism. Another way that Islam contributed to this world was to teach this world a higher standard of morality. Before Islam, you would find in Makkah Arabs who would bury their daughters alive. You would find in Makkah Arabs who would literally make tawaf of the Kaaba naked. Prostitution and zina were normal in, in, in Arabia. Alcohol was normal. Islam came and, and curbed all of this put it all to the side, turn it all into vices that only you know, the fringes of society committed. And the bulk of society refrained from it. It transformed the entire Arabian world from a land where people indulged in every type of vice into the most moral community in the history of this world. That today we look at the Sahaba and we say they are the most moral group of people to have ever lived. 
But they weren't born in that. They weren't grow, growing up in that environment. Islam came and transformed them. And that morality spread. And it is what was the foundation of Islam throughout our history. And it's only when Muslims drifted away from that morality <clears throat> that we began to experience economic and political weakness. So only in the late Ottoman era, when Muslims started to you know, engage in zina and alcohol again, and these became norms again, that we began to see weakness creep back into the Ummah. But Islam brought a higher standard of morality. Another way in which Islam contributed to this world is that Islam brought the best economic system this world has ever seen. The economic system applied by the Muslim empires of the past eradicated poverty. There was no homelessness in the Muslim empire. We had okaf, we had various okaf for things like medical expenses, things like education, things like housing. Everything was provided for. We had the zakah system that ensured that if somebody got rich, they're taking many others along with them. We had all of this, this in, in place. And this was the best economic system to ever exist. Islam brought many, many things to this world. And what many people fail to realize is that the contributions of Islam to this world are not just spiritual and moral, but even material contributions. So during the golden age of Islam, the Muslims weren't just the most spiritual or powerful empire in the world, but they were the most advanced. In the Abbasid Empire, in the capital of Baghdad, the Abbasid rulers established one of the world's first prominent research centers, Beitul Hikmah. And from Beitul Hikmah came some of the greatest discoveries in the history of this world. It was there at Beitul Hikmah that algebra was invented. Algebra, algebra was invented at Beitul Hikmah, a science that would change the world. Everything we have today, all of our technology we have today, originates in those, in those mathematical discoveries made in Beitul Hikmah. It was in that golden age, in that place, that discoveries were made in, in medicine, where Muslims established the world's first medical colleges where you had to have a medical license to practice medicine. This idea originated in the Muslim world. Today it's a global standard norm. That the Muslim world came and it, and it contributed to almost every science possible, from geography to the study of the stars and planets to the, the study of the human body. All of these sciences you will find that in the golden age of Islam, Muslims produced some of the most important discoveries. And this is why, even today, many of the non-Muslim historians will say, and you can find direct quotes of them saying this, that the, the Western world doesn't just owe the Muslim world a few scientific discoveries, it owes the Muslim world its existence. It owes the Muslim world its existence. Why? Islam came to this world. It encouraged an environment of seeking knowledge and discovery and science and, and growth and becoming the best you can be. Muslims took this, they grew into a mighty empire. Christians went to the Muslim world. They studied in the Muslim world. They took these ideas back to their lands. And it's only when they went, for example, to Islamic Spain, and they studied in the universities of Islamic Spain, and they learned philosophy, and they learned science, and they learned mathematics, and then they went back to Europe. They went back to, to, to France and to, to, to the, what is today the United Kingdom. They went back to all of those lands with these ideas from the Muslim world. That's when the Renaissance happened. That's when the shift happened in the West when they came to the Muslim world and learned these ideas and took it back. So for those who say that Islam has not contributed anything to this world, this is wrong, this is false. Almost everything we have today in this world, Muslims play the role in it. From justice to morality, from science to technology, from economic prosperity to the eradication of poverty, Islam came and played major contributions in all of that. The problem today is not with Islam. The problem today is with Muslims. That Islam still is just as, just as relevant today as it always was. And Islam today is, can still be just as transformational as it always was. But it's up to us to embody it. It's up to us to understand it properly. It's up to us to practice it. It's up to us to take it and to give it to the world and to show the world 
what Islam, what value Islam can bring to their lives. We ask Allah to accept our efforts and to make us room models of this religion. Subhanahu wa ta'ala, the Amasifun, wa salam ala Rasulin, wa alhamdulillah, wa alhamdulillah. إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعين ونستغفره ونؤمن به توكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضل فلا هادي له ما بعد. So what happened? The Muslim world grew into this powerful empire. It produced great scholars, great saints, great doctors, great scientists, great mathematicians, great politicians. It became the dominant civilization in this world. What happened? Well, many things happened, but to summarize it, World War I happened. In World War I, the Ottoman Empire was on the losing side. And the Ottoman Empire was defeated. Its lands were divided amongst the British and the French and their allies. And, and it was cut up into many small countries and given to their various allies, and the Muslims fell into political weakness. 100 years later, we are still recovering from this. But understand that this situation we are in, of there being no caliphate, of there being no central Muslim power, of Muslims being in a state of political weakness, this is something that's still new. This is something that is still new. It only happened less than 100 years ago. There are still people alive who were alive when the Ottoman Empire existed. That's how recent it is. That's literally how recent it is. This is still a new development. And the reality is, that Islam can rise again. And Muslims, it's up to us. The way we understand Islam, the way we practice Islam, the way we represent Islam, the way we contribute to this world to, to make Islam powerful again. It doesn't have to be political power. There's spiritual power. There's moral power. There's economic power. We can still rise up in all these areas. And the world today is facing so many dangerous ideologies and ideas that really only Islam, only Islam can solve it. So we said what Islam brought to this world. Let's look at what Islam can bring to the world today. What Islam can contribute to civilization today. Number one, number one is a return to morality. We said 1,400 years ago, the Arabs would make Kaaba, some of them would make uh, Tawaf of the Kaaba naked, some of them, you know, would bury their daughters alive, and Islam came and changed that. Today, again, nudity and immorality and, and abortion of children, all of this has become norms. <coughs> Islam can fix that. Islam can fix that. We have to represent Islam. We have to share this message with the world. People don't realize what a dangerous situation the world is in today. Immorality today is worse than it's ever been in the history of humanity. The level of immorality that you are exposed to with the click of a button today has never existed before. And this is destroying homes, this is destroying families, this is destroying people on the inside. And only Islam, only Islam has the principles to stop this. Because in this day and age, it's only Muslims that are calling on people to dress appropriately. It's only Islam that's calling on us to lower our gaze. It's only Islam that's calling on us to live in this moral code while everybody else is just giving up and going with the times and going with the flow, not realizing how much this is destroying the world. Linked to that, what Islam can contribute to the world today is a return to family values. With the rise of immorality comes the fall of family. Even Muslims a thousand years ago had warned about this. That they warned that the reason why zina is haram is because it destroys the notion of family. It destroys the concept of family. And people in the past may not have been able to understand why because they never witnessed a zina culture. But we are witnessing it before our eyes. Today, because zina is so easily accessible, people don't want to get married. People don't stay committed to marriage. People commit sins even while they are married. People don't want to get married. They don't want to have children. People don't respect their parents anymore. They don't respect their siblings anymore. Family as a concept is dying. And again, Islam is the only solution to this. 
or the main solution to this, the most practical solution to this. That Islam comes and it teaches us the importance of family values. And what's going to happen is, those civilizations that choose to go down the route of immorality, they're going to have a very, they're going to have to make a very strange decision soon. Because their next few generations are not going to be producing children. Whether they choose immoral lifestyles where you can't produce children, or whether because of individualism they choose not to have children, but as an entire society, they are producing less and less children with each generation. And their governments are starting to worry. Because if you give people so much free access to zina, why would they ever want to get married and commit and be responsible and raise children? And when this becomes a social norm, society will decrease over time. But Islam, on the other hand, values family ties. It is one of the five most important things in Islam, is family. Your parents, your spouse, your children, your siblings, even your cousins and your cousins' cousins. It goes on and on. Islam teaches you to maintain family ties. It teaches you to have a, a big family. It te teaches you to raise your family well. It teaches you to treat all of your family members well. And this is why it's only Muslims who practice Islam that can withstand this tide of what we are going through today. And that's why Islam remains the fastest growing religion in the world. Because while all the other nations are now choosing to have less and less children, Muslims are still growing in numbers. They're growing through conversion and they're growing through having children. And they're growing through the converts having children. Because I have met so many people personally who before Islam they didn't want to have children, then they converted to Islam and alhamdulillah now they have 12 children. So one person converting to Islam produced a whole new ummah of Muslim followers. And this is the way Islam is spreading. So Islam can help the world return to family values. Another way in which Islam can help the world today is to give them an alternative economic structure. Because the Islamic economic system worked. For over a thousand years it worked. It eradicated poverty, it eradicated homelessness, it reduced crime. It made life such that even the people who were not wealthy, even those who lived a simple life, were content and they had enough. They had food, they had water, they had clothes, they had a home, they were happy. Islam brought about a system like that. The problems we have today is because the Muslim world abandoned that system and embraced the riba system. They embraced the modern system. Where everything's about money. And everything's about piling money upon money, riba upon riba. If we had to abandon that system, and the solution is not to go to communism, that's the opposite extreme, right? The solution is to return to Islam. That if we could show the world working models today of the Islamic economic system, we can show the world a better way forward. Because even amongst the non-Muslims, people are frustrated. They are frustrated at the economic system. They realize the current system is making the rich richer and making the rest of the world poorer. And they know communism never work either. And they don't know where to look for a solution. We have the solution. We have to show it, we have to present it. We have to show people that we have an economic system, a divinely revealed economic system that works. And finally, what Islam can bring to the world today is purpose. One of the biggest problems when you go out there and you talk to people who don't know about Islam, one of the biggest things causing them anxiety is that their lives have no purpose. And so they go around the world looking for purpose. And they say, we need to invent our own purpose. We need to have some reason to love. <clears throat> One of the reasons that suicide, uh, suicide rates are like skyrocketing is why? Because people see no reason to love. They literally see no reason to love. Islam gives you a reason to love. <clears throat> Islam is one of the only parts today that will show you a genuine reason to love no matter what situation you're going through. And this is why, again, you will find practicing Muslims who are living in a war zone, who have more inner peace than sometimes a multi-millionaire in the U.S. Because they have purpose to their life and they have a connection with their creator. And this is becoming more and more necessary. As the world drifts deeper into individualism, as the world drifts deeper into immorality, as the world drifts deeper into the greed, we are seeing rising levels of anxiety, of depression, of depression, of suicide. And Islam 
when it enters your heart, when it gives you purpose, when it gives you direction in life, it lowers all of that. It lowers the chances of all of that. Because many of the causes of that disappear. That people who are depressed about, you know, there not being an afterlife or not being a purpose to life, that goes away. People who are anxious about the future, when they have the walk of Allah, that decreases. People who are suicidal, when they have a purpose to their life and a connection with the Creator, it decreases that, that problem in their mind. Islam can solve these problems by us bringing to the people the message of Islam. So today, Islam is not just relevant, it's more relevant than ever before. The world is headed towards deep problems. And as the entire world indulges with their nafs and just follows their desires, they are heading deeper and deeper into problems. As the ummah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is our duty to show the world a better way. To show them the morality of Islam. To show them the justice of Islam. To show them the rational of Islam. To show them the purpose and the peace and contentment that Islam brings to you. And if we are to showcase this to the world, then Islam will grow even faster. And again, another miracle of Islam, to end off on this high note, another miracle of Islam, despite the fact that Muslims have been in a state of political weakness for the past hundred years, Islam has grown faster in the past hundred years than the four hundred years before it. If you look at the number of Muslims in the world today compared to a hundred years ago, Islam has skyrocketed in numbers. And it's growing even faster than ever before. Why? Because Islam may not be a political power anymore. But now we have Muslims in every country in the world. And people who previously would not have been exposed to Islam now live next door to Muslims. And Islam is growing faster because of that. So this is Qadrullah. Allah wanted Islam to reach these lands. Allah wanted Islam to reach Canada and the US and Australia and UK and South America and South Africa. So Allah allowed this political problem to occur. So Muslims left their lands and moved to these lands. So Islam reached those lands so the people of those lands can convert to Islam. There's always wisdom in everything that Allah has decreed. And so Islam is now the fastest growing religion in the world. It always has been, but it's growing faster than ever. But if we can showcase Islam, not just be Muslims by name, not just be Muslims caught up in our own tiny groups, but to actually showcase the value of Islam to the world, then inshallah Islam will grow even faster. Rabbana adina fi dunya hasana wa bil akhirati hasana wa qina adhaba al-nar Rabbana hablana min azwajina wa dhuriyatina qurra da'amin wa ajalna li muttaqina imama Subhana rabbil izda'ama yisifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin akibis salam